Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, it's like they say, I know where you live, <laughs> even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas, Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for the power of your word. You don't pussyfoot around with the churches. This letter was written to Pergamos, but we are told, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This applies to us. We pray, Father, for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, as you know, the last time that we were in Revelation, we finished up with the church in Smyrna. Of course, uh, last week we had the outreach special, The Case for Christ, and so we're going back two weeks to get to the church at Smyrna. And tonight, beginning the church at Pergamos. But it's important for us to understand the context of Pergamos in relation to Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos. Because as you look at a map, we're moving in sort of an arch to the north. We start with Ephesus. About 40 miles north of that is Smyrna. And about 100 miles north of Ephesus is Pergamos. So as the Lord Jesus Christ gives his letters <clears throat> to the seven churches, he's making sort of an arc, going from church to church. And in each church, we see certain things that are good and certain things that are bad. We find as we go through the churches that the exhortation is not merely to that individual church, but it's a warning for all of the churches to come. And so it is here with Pergamos. The first church on the list was Ephesus. And they had something very striking in common with Pergamos that we're studying tonight. As we learned then, the Nicolaitans had both evil doctrines and immoral practices. And the church at Ephesus handled the Nicolaitans in one particular way, which was strict rejection. But Pergamos compromised with the Nicolaitans so much that it grotesquely damaged the church even though they had some very good things said about them. And in between those two, Ephesus and Pergamos, Christ sent his message to Smyrna, the church that refused to compromise either in doctrine or practice, and as a result they suffered terribly. We always love to compromise when it gets us out of trouble. 
But Smyrna wasn't going to do that. Even though Ephesus hated the Nicolaitans, that was not enough. You know, being ne negative is never enough. Ephesus was a good, sound doctrinal church, and they were negative about the Nicolaitans. But being negative is never enough. The Apostle Paul, years before this, had prophesied the defection and the destruction of the church in Ephesus. He did that in his farewell to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, and so it happened. That's amazing because Ephesus was the most doctrinally sound church among the seven churches listed here in Revelation 2 and 3. Ephes Ephesus was very close to what I think we could call a militant Bible Presbyterian fundamentalist church. They believed all the doctrines of grace, the sovereign doctrines of God. But today, they no longer exist because of one reason. They had lost their first love for Christ. Even though Ephesus rejected the doctrine and the practice of the Nicolaitans, Satan used the prophesied defection and corruption of the elders at Ephesus to drag them into different false doctrine that ended in the immoral practices that Israel had during the days of Balaam. I gave you five reasons that Ephesus should not have fallen into false doctrine, and yet they did. I hope you remember these. Some of you weren't here before, so I'll go ahead and read them quickly. The five reasons that they should never have fallen into false doctrine were these. Number one, Paul himself had started the church at Ephesus. Number two, Paul himself had ordained all the elders in Ephesus. Number three, Paul had written the incredible book of Ephesians to that church. Number four, church history records for us that Timothy was ordained the first bishop of Ephesus close to the time of the death of Paul. Number five, Christ himself praised the church 30 years later. They were still hanging on 30 years later when John wrote the book of Revelation to that firm doctrinal stance. But that was when Jesus warned them that they were losing or had lost their first love. How did the devil get through to the church at Ephesus? It took a time, but it was through an ecumenical council. Just remember, the so-called ecumenical movement is of the devil. If you let others come in who do not agree with your doctrine and then let them participate in official activities, this sets both the doctrinal and practical stance of the church aside. Eventually, apostates will also creep in and they will change the church from the inside. The devil loves to steal what God's people have built. Ephesus was like us doctrinally, like Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood. But the church began to lose members through death and attrition. In the changing culture, they were beginning to shrink and were desperate for members. Does this sound familiar? Leadership was divided and they began to join forces with divergent so-called Christian groups who eventually took over the church and ultimately killed it. The council of Ephesus was an early church council called to hammer out theoretically doctrine that was believed by the church to stop the spread of heresy and apostasy, but it ended up inserting heresy as official doctrine. Now, over the past couple of weeks, I shared with you how that location, that is, Ephesus, the site of the most doctrinally sound church in Revelation, was where Satan introduced Mariolatry and showed you the various stages in Roman Catholic history where that blasphemous doctrine was added to and developed. It was at the Council of Ephesus in 431 that the council invented the, quote, exaltation of Mary. This was the first church council at Ephesus to apply the term Mother of God to Mary. That's 431 AD. This was a church that lost its first love for Christ and ended up loving Mary. Failing to practice the Bible doctrine of separation, they couldn't resist the pull of their culture, a culture that was in love with a mother goddess. Great is Diana of the Ephesians! It was at Ephesus that Mary became the queen of heaven, a term used for various fertility cult goddesses in the ancient pagan world. Pagans worshipped the queen of heaven with cultic prostitution. 
I gave you the lesson for that when we studied Ephesus. And here's the lesson. Without agape love for Christ, sound doctrine eventually erodes into pagan sexual orgies and erotic sensual love for pagan gods. That's how the devil finally got Ephesus, by pulling them to the worship of Mary. At Ephesus, Paul found disciples of John the Baptist. He pointed them to Christ. But it was also at Ephesus that Paul discovered demon-possessed people and people using magic incantations in the synagogue when he preached there. And we read you all the passages out of Acts chapter 19. And when those people got saved, there was initially a clear separation in the Ephesian church. The true doctrine and abandonment of pagan practices. Acts 19, 18. Many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Burn the pagan stuff. Get rid of all the pagan stuff. If you've got any occultic kind of books, if you've got any astrology books, folks, what you need to do is take them and burn them. God will not tolerate those kinds of practices. You read the horoscope in the newspaper, shame on you, throw it away, burn it up. Don't look at it. That is of the devil, and you know it, and you should not fiddle around with it. I won't even eat the fortune cookies, so-called, that they give at the Chinese restaurants because they have little fortunes in them. I'm not going to read those pieces of paper, and I'm not going to read the, uh, eat the cookies that they're found in. Besides the fact I hate their flavor. <laughs> but I don't participate in that stuff, and I hope you don't either. Then we concluded by showing that pagan sex goddess worship is still alive in the evangelical church today through the devil's tool of pornography. I pointed out that extensive research has shown that in most evangelical Bible-believing churches, approximately half of the men are involved in online pornography, and so are many of the women. It's merely the digital version of the ancient perversion that we see manifested in the Balaam incident and the Ephesus decay. Sex outside of marriage will always destroy a church, rotting it from the inside out, just like it did at Ephesus. I hope that none of you are involved in that. We talked about how Rome claims it has biblical authority to call Mary the Queen of Heaven. From the book of Revelation, there are three women the Bride of Christ, who's the one that we're part of. And then Israel is presented, and then the Whore of Babylon. Those are the three principal women in the book of Revelation. None of them are Mary, and none of them are the Queen of Heaven that you could call Mary. The bottom line is this. Satan loves to see Bible-believing, doctrinally sound churches fall into pagan worship, and that will always happen when a church loses its first love for Jesus Christ. Now, briefly, let's go back to Smyrna for just a second before we jump into Pergamos. As I noted last week, and as I said just a minute ago, um, Smyrna was called Smyrna the Lovely, the crown of Ionia, the ornament of Asia. It was a very rich and wicked city, just 40 miles north of Ephesus. That's a long way in the ancient world where you have to walk everything. But it was different. In Smyrna, the principal religious opposition came not from pagans, but from Jews. They were Jews of a very vicious sort. In fact, Jesus accuses them of blasphemy. But the church in Smyrna was willing to suffer for Christ, and as a result, there is still a Christian population in Smyrna 2,000 years later. The church of Smyrna still exists today. It has an active harbor. It's the principal city of Anatolia, and has a mixed population of between 200,000 and 300,000 people. I think I mentioned this last week of that number, nearly 100,000 call themselves Christians. Now, I know that they're probably not all genuine Christians, but these are people who are still calling themselves Christians 2,000 years after the letter to Smyrna in the book of Revelation. They didn't give up. Now, probably a lot of those are cultural Christians, but these are people who continue to maintain a legacy even in the face of murderous Muslim opposition. And last week, I posited the question, if the Lord tarries another 2,000 years, I wonder what will be the visible legacy of Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood. What will we leave behind 
that people will know that there have been Christians here in this place. We closed our study of Smyrna by noting that Polycarp, the disciple of John, was the chief pastor of that church. I read you the historical record of his testimony and death. He had learned his lessons well from John the Apostle. He was one of the disciples of John, who wrote the book of Revelation. He became one of the most famous martyrs of the early church when he was killed in about 169 AD. And so we have a direct contrast in comparison with Ephesus. Ephesus had multiple elders chosen and ordained by Paul, but they later split apart, as he had prophesied, and ended up with a church that established one of the most horrible doctrines of Rome. We say it's one of the most horrible because it transfers the glory of Christ to Mary, who in this case is merely a renaming of a pagan fertility goddess. Ephesus suffered no real persecution, but they fell. On the other hand, in contrast, Smyrna had one faithful man who passed the torch to one faithful man who stood firm unto death, and the entire church suffered at the hands of the synagogue of Satan. That's what it says there in Revelation. They suffered imprisonment, they suffered tor torture, they suffered martyrdom, but they remained steadfast, and the church there still remains today. Now, looking between Smyrna and Pergamos. Smyrna had the synagogue of Satan, but Pergamos, the next church on the list, had Satan's seat. Satan's seat in contrast to just a synagogue of Satan. That entire area was obviously a hotbed of demonic activity, just like Collingswood with its pro-homosexual culture. The Ephesian pagan culture complained that they didn't have money because Paul was destroying their income from the shrines of Diana. <laughs> the problem? The population stopped buying into the tokens of paganism when they got saved. That should happen here. That should happen every place. There's a Bible-preaching church out there proclaiming the gospel of Christ. The church apparently had plenty of money since nothing is mentioned about their temporal needs there in Ephesus. But smart of the persecutors were rich Jews, and the text specifically states that the people in the church were poor in terms of temporal riches. So it wasn't money that kept that church running for the last 2,000 years. They were poor people. Application. There's an important lesson in this for us. It's not money that keeps the church going. It's people. If a church is growing with committed people, it will survive, even if it has no money, and even if it's under the most intense persecution and opposition from the outside. That's why we at Collingswood BPC must, without question, focus on reaching people with the gospel of Christ, and we ignore that to our own peril. The believers at Smyrna also had the promise of crowns for holding on faithfully, and that's the great and precious doctrine of heavenly rewards. And the New Testament, as we said last week, has much to say about crowns and heavenly rewards, and you've heard me preach sermons on that subject, so I won't read all the passages like we did last time, but let me summarize for you the four main categories. There are four main categories of crowns that we looked at. Category one, crowns are connected to extreme striving for Christ. They are not connected to mediocre service. Extreme striving for Christ. Crowns are not for people who are lazy. They are not for me first people. They are not for self-interested people. They are not for self-serving people. They are not for comfort-loving couch potatoes. If you want crowns, you have to strive for them. Paul uses many athletic illustrations. He talks about not beating the air, but keeping under his body, bringing it into subjection. Oh, my people, how many of you are doing that? How, am I doing that? I have to ask myself that question every day. Extreme striving with the utmost energy. You want crowns? That's category one. Category two, crowns are connected to people we have led to Christ. Crowns are connected to people you have led for Christ. When was the last time that you led somebody to Christ? I praise God he let me lead somebody to Christ in February this year. What a joy to see her sitting on the first row of this church this morning. Number three, crowns are connected to ending life in faithful, uncompromising service. 
You've got to cross the finish line, folks. Ending life in faithful, uncompromising service. It's not enough to run the first part of the race for 55 years or 65 years or 75 years and then sit down on the track and congratulate yourself before you reach the finish line. You must finish the race as a winner to get a crown. Number four, crowns can be lost by sin and by compromise. Ones that you've already got in your hand. They can be lost by sin and compromise. That means that you can lose crowns that you have currently won. Don't be an idiot and fall into sinful compromise before you reach the finish line. Once you cross the finish line, which is at death, <laughs> you don't cross it before then. Once you cross the finish line at death, you won't have to worry about that anymore. But you have to cross the finish line without the compromise and sin that loses crowns. So tonight, Pergamos, verses 12 through 17. The first thing that Jesus says to Pergamos is a reminder that the final authority is the word of God. These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. And verse 16, I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any, what? Two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. It has two edges. And that's how Jesus introduces himself to the church at Pergamos. These things have he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. That first thing he says to Pergamos is a reminder that the final authority is the word of God, not their feel-good theology that ended up here in grotesque sins, sex sins. Pergamos had a few good things going for it, but they obviously had not taken a stand on moral issues or on separation from worldliness. As a result, fornication was rampant in the church and a perverted form of so-called Christian liberty. Boy, how that has been bandied around and misused. We do have liberty in Christ, but not the way the compromising Christians talk about it. Remember something else. He talks there about fornication. I have a few things against thee, because you have those there who've taught it's okay, last part of verse 14, to commit fornication. There are evangelical churches, so-called, today, that teach it's okay to commit fornication, or say nothing about it, or exercise no church discipline on it. And remember, fornication is much broader than adultery. Fornication includes every form of sin out of God-ordained marriage between one man and one woman till death us do part. All sex outside of marriage, God's design for marriage between one man and one woman, which lasts until death. And there are a lot of very gross sex sins that perverts have invented. But these are not okay with God, even if some so-called evangelicals are promoting, for example, gay marriages, or living together, or serial marriages, that's what I call it, divorce and remarriage, which is merely legalized adultery. But the final authority is scripture, not what made them feel good. Remember that when you start talking about so-called Christian liberty that is really only an excuse for carnality. Hear what the Bible has to say. I quoted it to you just a moment ago, verse 12, but I'm also going to read verse 13 for you now. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It gets in there in the, the very heart issues of your life and your mind and of the joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intense. What are you thinking about? What are your motivations, the intents of the heart? Verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Now listen to these next phrases. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He's just talked about the Bible in verse 12. 
Now, he says, the Bible reveals your real motives, especially if they're designed to stimulate the flesh. Verse 13 said that you're naked when God looks into your heart. You will never be able to fool him. You know, clothing and makeup can hide your ugly fat and your ugly face, but if you have nothing on, everybody would see what you are really like. God sees you naked all the time. The Christians at Pergamos were truly saved, but they were clearly carnal Christians, although verse 13 does prove their salvation. Verse 13 says, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Oedipus was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. There are four commendations that prove that these were saved people. Number one, their works proved their salvation. Number two, clinging to the name of Christ through thick and thin. Number three, never denying the faith of Christ. Number four, martyrdom. I said just a few minutes ago that Pergamos was located about 100 miles north of Ephesus with Smyrna about halfway in between the two. But as concerning sin, the primary focus of Pergamos appears to be the temporal world, what is known today as worldliness. Pergamos ignored the sharp two-edged sword on the issue of worldliness. But you know the New Testament has a lot to say on the subject of worldliness. John 15, Jesus speaking. This is the upper room discourse. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. You are not like the world. If you are, that's worldly. And if the world hates you, it's because you are living not like the world. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. This is the thing we do stuff in. Present your bodies, not just your spirit, not just your soul. And then you can do anything you want with your body, sort of get out there and enjoy the touchy-feely stuff, you know. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Oh, okay, what kind of sacrifice? It's got to be holy. 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 Isaiah 6. Whether the cherubim and the seraphim cry out, and the living creatures surrounding the throne of God. Holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The heavens and earth are filled with his glory. I beseech you, brethren, present your bodies and be holy. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Be ye holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Whether you believe it or not, that includes moral purity. That is the command of Scripture, and it is contrary to the world. It's to be holy, and that's acceptable to God. Next phrase. And this is not unreasonable, because he says, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. You see, holiness does not conform to the world. What is acceptable to God does not conform to the world. What is your reasonable service does not conform to the world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove you're going to demonstrate publicly, openly, without shame, without compromise, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Worldliness is not part of of the perfect, acceptable will of God. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us to denying ungodliness and... Who knows the verse? What's next? Worldly lusts. That's what you're supposed to deny. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. you got to live here, but you don't live like it. You deny it. You say, that's not me. I'm a citizen 
of a different country, a heavenly country. And I don't want my king to be ashamed of me. I will not live like this world. Live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And then the next verse, of course, speaks of the rapture. James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure religion. You want to know what pure religion is? And undefiled before God and the Father is this. Here's what pure religion, undefiled religion, is like. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and the two things. Number one, taking care of widows and orphans. Number two, to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's what God calls us to do. James is a little more blunt about it over in chapter 4. Verse 4. <clears throat> Listen to what he has to say to worldly Christians. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Enmity means hatred. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Whoa. Do you still think worldliness is okay? Do you think, still think it's okay to be a carnal Christian? To just so you can get along and slide in there like, like, like a greased pig in a swimming pool? You worldly? That means you hate God. If you're the friend of the world, you are the enemy of God. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. We don't like that. John has a little bit more to say over in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. You see, Pergamos already knew these things. But they decided to feel good instead. Here's what John says in 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, now get the next phrase, the love of the Father is not in him. You love the things of the world? And you say, yeah, I do, sort of, but you know, I really, really, really love God. God says you're a liar. God says, the love of the Father is not in you. You can fake it all you want, but God, remember, we are open before him, we are naked before him. He understands the intents, the thoughts, and the motives of our hearts. He looks around and he says, you know what? I don't see the love of God in here anywhere. Instead, what I see is the love of the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Did they have that at Pergamos? Yeah. The lust of the eyes, did they have that at Pergamos? Yeah. The pride of life, did they have that at Pergamos? Yeah. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. In other words, folks, that's temporal stuff. What is the temporal stuff that you love so much you couldn't bear to be without? All that's in the world, the lust thereof, the world pass away, and its lust. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Jesus defines the problem at Pergamos in the opening verses. Now let's talk about Pergamos in terms of its status. Pergamos was a powerful city. In fact, it was the capital of Asia for 250 years. With a huge library of 200,000 handwritten volumes. Mark Anthony was so impressed that he took that entire library and sent it to his lover, Queen Cleopatra of Egypt. He got it out of Pergamos, built on sort of a, a big conical-shaped mountain. Perhaps the most astounding thing to the credit of believers in Pergamos was that the devil himself had taken up his residence there and they were constantly under his nose. 
You know, many have made different kinds of suggestions as to what it means when it says that Satan's seat was at Pergamos. Some people have suggested that Satan's seat was the great altar of Zeus on the Acropolis in Pergamos, this, this big conical-shaped mountain. Some have suggested that Satan's seat was the worship of the god Asclepios. That was the god of healing, who was always depicted as a snake. Some have suggested that Satan's seat was a reference to emperor worship, since that was the strongest pagan cult in the city of Pergamos. But I personally think we don't have to guess. We can take the text at face value. That's where Satan dwelt. Satan himself lived there at that time. And there are multiple reasons for that conclusion. Number one, Satan is a creature. He's a created being. In other words, he is localized both in time and space. Satan is not omniscient, omnipresent, or omnipotent. He can only be in one place at one time, although he can move from place to place with great speed. And it's clear from the Bible that he does this. But he has a home base where his hordes of demons report to him to keep him updated on what's going on around the world and where they get their marching orders for the spiritual battle that they are waging against God's people. But the most obvious reason stated in the text in verse 13 is where we read the phrase, where Satan dwelleth. So we don't have to guess at where, what it means about Satan's seat. This is where Satan dwells. This is where he lives. To state the obvious, the text says that Satan lived in Pergamos. Clearly, as we'll see when we get further into the book of Revelation, there are huge periods in history where Rome is his seat, and finally, during the Great Tribulation, where Jerusalem will be his seat when he indwells the Antichrist, who sits as God in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And so I understand this statement to be a straightforward statement of fact. Satan's home base at that time was Pergamos. I don't think you'd want to live there as a Christian. But these people did. Pergamos also had at least one incredible hero of faith who stood as a clarion call and a shining example for the entire church. His name, and we're given it here in the text, was Antipas. He was probably the pastor of that church. Pastors who preach the word tend to get targeted. Jesus himself, who is sending these letters to the seven churches, called him my faithful martyr who was slain among you. Early church history tells us that the way he was martyred was during a riot by the priests and worshipers of Asclepios, where they burned him to death in a brass bull during the reign of the emperor Domitian. He was a pastor who personally refused to compromise. Personally, he'd set that example. But after his death, the church began to fall into worldliness and immorality, even though they held on to the heart of the faith with tenacity. There's a lesson in this for every church. Having a good pastor does not guarantee that you will be a mature, non-compromising Christian. The pastor can set an example for you, but you are personally accountable to God. In fact, if he's a good pastor, you are more accountable than if you had no examples to follow. You must learn to stand alone for holiness, for purity, and for righteousness. But then we get to verses 14 and 15, which tell us what happened after Pastor Antipas was executed. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Remember, there were two churches that had problems with the Nicolaitans, Ephesus and Pergamos. Each church handled the problem dif differently. Ephesus nailed the Nicolaitans. Ephesus examined them and rejected them. The church at Ephesus would still be with us today if they didn't have one other weakness. They lost their love for Christ. But they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And doctrine always produces deeds. 
You've heard me say it many times. What you really believe will determine the way that you live. Let me say it again. What you really believe will determine the way in which you live. That truism is proved by Pergamos. The doctrine of Balaam is set in parallel with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans because both of those doctrines end in gross immorality among God's people. We learned multiple things about the doctrine and deeds of Balaam when we were studying the church at Ephesus. We saw how that fit in perfectly with the picture painted for us in Revelation concerning both Ephesus and Pergamos. The correct approach that a church should have to heretical or apostate doctrine is, as they say, throw the bums out. That's called church discipline. Titus chapter 3 verses 10 and 11. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition. What's the next word? You should know this. Reject. Reject. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. That's how you handle heretics. There are two different categories of bad guys. There are heretics and there are apostates. Heretics are people who cause division. Hieresis is the Greek word behind heretic. But then there are those who are apostates, those who preach a false gospel, and handling them is even more drastic. Second John, verses 1 and following. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For... Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves. Now here we have something dealing with rewards. That we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. So what is going to be our issue? He gave you the hint when he said they confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Now here it is. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, he's preaching a different Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, what? The doctrine of Christ. Receive him not into your house, Neither bid him God's speed, for he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker in his evil deeds. God's speed is like we say, you know, have a nice day. You get Jehovah's Witnesses come to your front door. You get Mormons come to your front door. Jehovah's Witnesses want to sell you, you know, some kind of little magazine, some kind of little booklet. Mormons want to get you involved in a Bible study or the Jehovah's Witnesses. You go to the front door. You don't let them in. You slam the door in their face. You don't say, well, I'm busy right now, but you all have a nice day. If you do that, you are a partaker of their evil deeds. The Bible says so. You don't want them to have a nice day. You hope they have a miserable day. You hope that God strikes them dead on the sidewalk or gets them converted before they get to the next house. Because they're leading people to hell. The church of Pergamos, for whatever reason, had refused to exercise church discipline. Perhaps they had thought that they would lose members, or perhaps that the people under discipline would turn them into the authorities. Perhaps they didn't want to discipline family members or friends. Perhaps some of the people needed, needing discipline were their employers or employees, and they didn't want their business to belly up by losing staff. Perhaps some of them were secretly involved in immorality themselves. Perhaps they were afraid they wouldn't do it right or afraid that they would be ostracized themselves if they challenged the moral perversion in other church members. Maybe they thought they were too busy or too afraid of the external persecution or too overwhelmed with family responsibilities. Maybe they thought that it wasn't that bad when compared to the pagan society around them, you know, like... Well, I know they're not married, but at least they're living together and seem to be faithful instead of sleeping around. In other words, maybe they were using all the same excuses that people in this church use 
for interacting with one another instead of keeping the church pure. I speak over a 75 year period of time. In conclusion of this little section, we find promises of three things to the believer who overcomes the lure of the world, worldliness, and the temptations of the flesh. The first thing that Jesus says he will give them, he says, I will give them hidden manna. Give them hidden manna. That takes us back to the visible manna of the Old Testament in the wilderness wanderings. God visibly sustained his people as they wandered toward Canaan. The church at Pergamos is promised not visible manna, it's promised hidden manna, non-visible manna. By the way, God would meet all their needs and sustain them as they continued faithful to him. Remember, this letter is to the churches. That means this, God's promise is to us as well. Jesus Christ himself is the bread of life who sustains us even now, although we do not see him. Then he says, I'll give them a white stone. In ancient Rome, a white stone with the name of the victor in an athletic contest was given to the athlete as a special token of winning his race. And the stone would have his name inscribed on it with a special title that gave him certain rights and privileges. And that ties in with the third thing that's promised to the overcomer. The overcomer will get a new secret name. He's the only one that will know it. It's like a personal name that the Lord gives to him as a personal token of love for overcoming the world. I had some special personal names that I gave to Judy. I never called anybody else by those names. She was the only one. And she called me by special names too. Those demonstrated a very special, special relationship Christ gives the white stone with a new secret name on it to those who overcome. You say, well, what is it? Well, it says, we don't know. We won't know the new name until we get to glory. But from this passage, it appears there will be a special title that will give us these rights and privileges when we get to heaven. Special personal access to the Lord himself. Well, our time is up. I was going to summarize for you tonight, but we can do this next week when we continue the church at Pergamos. The summary of Satan's methods at Ephesus versus, in contrast to, his tactics and his methods at Pergamos. What he was using, Satan has tried all the different methods to get in to churches. And some of them work and some of them don't work. And Satan has had 2,000 years to practice on churches Bible-believing churches in every culture, in every nation, all with different backgrounds, all in different cultural settings, and he knows what works. So, as we compare and contrast the methods that Satan used at Ephesus and Pergamos, hopefully we'll learn something that we ourselves need to know. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you so much for the privilege of studying your word. And we pray once again that your word will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We praise you, we thank you, for you are a God of grace. You are a God of glory. And how we thank you that Jesus is the Lord of the church. Not just of the church at large, the church universal, but he is the Lord of this church. And to him we humbly bow and pray that we might love him and serve him, that you would keep us from false doctrine, that you would keep us from wicked, evil practices, from worldliness, and from things that are even worse than that. Father, we commit this message to you in Jesus' name. Amen.